If you visit Zion National Park today, you're likely to see something like this, or this, and most definitely this. But what you're not likely to see is this, a mountain lion. You might call it a cougar, a catamount, a panther, or a puma, depending on where you live. But no matter what you call it, these are all the same species. Felis concolor, the world's fourth largest cat. Pound for pound, mountain lions are one of the most lethal felines on the planet. They've been known to take down bull moose, which can be almost 10 times their size. They're primarily ambush predators, relying on stealth, explosive movement, and ferociously powerful jaws to deliver suffocating bites to the necks of their unwitting prey. As solitary hunters, they require large amounts of uninterrupted habitat to support themselves, something completely at odds with current human development patterns. And like most of their large carnivore brethren, mountain lions have been driven out of most of their historic range. One of the areas cougars do still inhabit, though, is Zion National Park, except in Zion Canyon. The heart and soul of Zion, the place that the vast majority of visitors come to see, is conspicuously devoid of mountain lions. The home of Angel's Landing, the Narrows, and the Great White Throne hasn't been home to mountain lions since the 1940s. And the reason for that is actually pretty simple. There's too many people. Mountain lions are generally pretty skittish animals and will avoid humans if at all possible. The hustle and bustle has driven them out of Zion Canyon in favor of the park's more isolated and less developed reaches. We can trace the beginnings of the cougar's retreat back to the early days of Zion itself. The park was officially designated in 1918 but the park underwent a decade of development between 1924 and 1934, which greatly improved its recreation and tourism infrastructure. Most of this development occurred in Zion Canyon. The new roads, highways, trails, and tunnels vastly improved the canyon's visitor experience, making one of America's great natural cathedrals more accessible than ever. In that decade, Zion's visitation grew by an astonishing 719%. But as we now know, that increase in visitation led to a decrease in mountain lion numbers in Zion Canyon. As early as 1939, park biologists J.S. Dixon and E.L. Sumner observed that, quote, the presence of these hundreds of human visitors tended to drive out the cougars, which are the chief natural enemies of the deer. Their report foreshadowed more than just the retreat of mountain lions into Zion's backcountry. As we've learned in previous videos, which I'll link to down below, when you remove a top-level predator from an ecosystem, ecological catastrophe tends to follow. With mountain lions out of the picture, Zion's mule deer were free to roam and graze in the bottom of the canyon. They quickly consumed most of the Virgin River streamside vegetation, including the all-too-familiar cottonwood trees. The mule deer population soon exploded, and by the 1940s, the situation had become so dire that park officials resorted to shipping deer out of the park in an effort to keep their numbers under control. It was at this point that the consequences of the cougar's removal became clear. After all, similar observations had been made in Yellowstone shortly after its wolves were exterminated. But just like Yellowstone, it would take decades to uncover the full extent of the damage. In 2005, the same researchers who uncovered Yellowstone's wolf cascade, Bill Ripple and Bob Beshta, would come to Zion to solve another ecological mystery. And this time, cougars were the culprit. What they would uncover is altogether remarkable and unsurprising. Unsurprising in the sense that park officials and biologists already had a sense that cougar removal was negatively impacting Zion Canyon's riparian ecosystem. But what Ripple and Beshta found that was truly remarkable was the extent of the impact the cougar's removal had on Zion Canyon. For their investigation, Ripple and Beshta compared two different areas in Zion National Park. Zion Canyon and the adjacent North Creek Canyon just nine miles away. These two canyons were virtually the same. They had the same geology, climate, and vegetation. The only difference was North Creek still had cougars. It wasn't subject to the same development pressures of Zion Canyon, and it remained relatively remote and quiet, a perfect environment for cougars. And so, these two canyons provided the perfect setting to test what happened to an ecosystem when cougars were removed. The impacts to Zion Canyon were well documented at this point. The removal of mountain lions had triggered an eruption of mule deer, which ate their way through the fragile streamside plants and led to considerable erosion along the Virgin River. But in North Creek, Ripple and Beshta found a virtual paradise. 
Not only were the cottonwoods growing full and healthy, but the stream banks of North Creek were fully intact. Because the stream banks were stable, native wildflowers like cardinal flower and aster flourished. These flowers, in turn, provided habitat for a whole host of butterfly species, including swallowtails, sulfurs, blues, satyrs, and monarchs. Five times as many butterfly species were found in North Creek as Zion Canyon. Likewise, all those butterflies meant a drastic increase in lizards, who ate the butterflies and lived among the streamside shrubs. Amphibians abounded as well. Red-spotted toads and canyon tree frogs hopped merrily along the lush riverbanks, appearing in numbers up to 200 times greater than their neighbors over in Zion Canyon. The stability of North Creek's banks also provided homes to desert fish. In Zion Canyon, where the lack of plant life caused the river to run swift and deep, it was nearly impossible for small aquatic life to survive. But North Creek's calm waters formed pools and shallow channels, perfect habitat for fish like the speckled dace and flannel mouth sucker. This was a true trophic cascade. Just like in Yellowstone, Ripple and Beshta had found definitive evidence that the removal of a top-level predator had profound consequences for the ecosystem at large. In Yellowstone, the removal of wolves led to an explosion of elk, which devastated its streamside communities. And now, in Zion, the removal of mountain lions had led to similar devastation with its mule deer. The case was now stronger than ever that predators had an undeniable role in the protection and preservation of the world's ecosystems. Here were two completely different animals in two completely different habitats impacting their ecosystems in remarkably similar ways. With top-level predators removed, the ecosystems of Yellowstone and Zion had crumbled. The same can be said of Isle Royal with its wolves. Numerous other studies have only bolstered the evidence in favor of the Green World hypothesis. And it's clear to me at least that the Green World hypothesis provides a ringing endorsement of protected places. It's no coincidence that the three stories I've told about it all take place in national parks. Parks, forests, refuges, these are some of the last remaining areas where we see these sort of ecological relationships take place. They're some of the last places where large predators roam free, where the sort of ecological balance they provide remains intact. Predators and protected places go hand in hand. We should all look to the Green World Hypothesis, with all of its lessons and implications, as a shining example of what can happen when we protect and preserve wild places. I hope you enjoyed this whirlwind tour through predators in our national parks. If you missed the first two installments, feel free to check those out. I'll link to them in the description down below. And if you've got any other stories of predators in national parks or protected areas, leave them down in the comments. I'd love to hear about them and possibly even tell them on the channel. And as always, if you want to learn more about the world's protected places, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.